Brian Cason with Giants. And this is a tall one here. <laughs> Literally a giant. <laughs> Literally a giant. Uh, just like his pops. And we're going to get into him in a second. This is Riley Keenan, and we're at Keenan uh, Family Estates here uh, on Spring Mountain. Um, and so, as you know, with this, with, this, uh, with this show, we always get into the wine first. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, what are we sipping on today? Uh, so this is our, this is our Nap Merlot. So this is really the standard bearer for really our entire Merlot program. Um, on any given year, we'll do you know four different single vineyard designates of Merlot, and then and then maybe one or two more broad, uh, broadly focused Merlot uh, skews. And this is really the consistent Merlot I mean, you'll see pretty much every single year, and have seen really since our inception uh, in 1974. So we've been making what was, I guess, originally this skew starting in 1977, um, all the way up till today. Um, it's slightly changed in a couple of regards, just in terms of the cepage and from different vineyards that we're sourcing from. Um, but it is a Napa Merlot, so the, the heart and soul of this is Spring Mountain, but there are a few other locations in which the, the Merlot comes from, primarily Primeros. Um, so yeah, this is, this is I think, our, our sort of way to get people into the Merlot game and, and show them what, what we're sort of, uh, what our approach is in terms of what we're trying to express our Merlot as. So it's a good place to start if you've just come across our wines, and, and it's a really good place to start if, uh, if you're trying to explore uh, the varietal more broadly. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what that is. So this is, uh, I've said this num on numerous, in numerous places, uh, they make the best Merlot in Napa to me. Um, I have not had this vintage, so I'm really excited. Um, I'm, if you've ch followed me on my Wine Wednesdays or my Wine Still of the Week, um, you've seen me do reviews on their, uh, their wines, and I've definitely done Merlot. So anyway, let's get right into this. Oh, let's talk about the nose here. So on the nose, I immediately get like plum skin, I get blueberries, I get a uh, dark cherry and some cassis going on here too. Yeah, the, the blue fruited quality is something that kind of pokes, pokes its head up uh, pretty frequently, um, really, at, well, as far as I've been paying attention, yeah. which is really only the last 15 years um, as I've grown into an adult. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the blue fruited quality is, is really interesting when it pops up. I see that very often with our Cap Franc as mm -hmm. well. Um, where that can kind of kind of toe the to the line between violet and sort of blue fruited, which is really cool, and it oftentimes is the Merlot as well. Um, it, it's it's a little controversial here in the house because I'll, I'll often <laughs> argue with my dad about um, you know what is blue fruited and, and, and that kind of thing because oftentimes he'll disagree that there's anything <laughs> about this wine. But um, it's funny; I, it seems to trend also younger too. A lot of my friends and our contemporaries, as far as age goes. Mm -hmm. Um, tend to pick out the blue fruit quality more often than I than I have seen my dad's age set to. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. It's obviously an adult, but uh, yeah. it's been my experience. It's funny um, you say that because that is like the first thing that jumped out for me. Um, and I'm a anybody who's been around me knows that the thing, the way to my heart, if you're uh, putting wine in front of me, is blue fruit and black fruit. Red fruit, cool, but I am a blue fruit, black fruit type of guy. I love those like kind of. The nuances that come with those types of, uh, either, I guess, types of fruit. So yeah, and red fruited can you know we've seen bad we have see every day bad yeah. examples of really red fruited wines. Mm -hmm. uh, Napa Valley produces some of them. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> they, they come off a little cheap to me. Yeah, yeah. and lush and I you know, so, and this often sometimes isn't always true, but yeah. the, the the red fruit dominant wines sometimes they can be um, you know the structure can be fairly mild. Not to say lack of structure. Finish can be a little quick. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, if you're dealing with black fruit, you, there's some causality between black fruited and great structure, good mm -hmm. acid, good tannin, um, and that kind of thing. You're absolutely right. There is a floral aspect to this too. You're right. There's there's like a, definitely a violet that I'm catching on the nose. A little bit of a black olive too, mm -hmm. like as a secondary that I'm catching the more I'm like, you know, swirling. Yeah, and there's a and I, I kind of put that all on the end of just. Especially at this age, because it's still very much encased in what I just sort of that that sort of just like lush barrel fruitiness that yeah. comes with a wine that's less than three years or a little bit over three years old. Um, but uh, so you're, it does it's not quite as pronounced now, but I can still kind of get it. But yeah, that, that black olive I kind of put in the same wing as just that sweet damp earth. Mm -hmm. That's kind of that red like soil type. Yeah. Of, yeah, that's that's it's funny because that's one of the tasting notes I get. When I'm uh, tasting a Bordeaux, a blind tasting Bordeaux, one thing I get is the wet soil thing, you know, specifically ripe, uh, 
some left bank too sometimes, but mostly right bank, mm -hmm. I tend to get this like wet soil thing that is a connect connective tissue for other wines out there. Totally. And so that's cool that I'm catching that from a Bordeaux varietal being grown in Napa on Spring Mountain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you can go like, uh, some of those St. Julian wines, St. Julian wines, mm -hmm. dirty, dirty, just like rotted wood, it's awesome. Yeah, I, I love, love that. Stuff. I love that too. The, oh God, I might mess up the pronunciation, but uh, the Bocchio, Chateau Bocchio. Uh, uh, it's like that orange, Bucchio. yellow. Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's uh, Chateau, uh, I should know. you or something? It's, I've never, uh, it's one of those labels I see all the time, but I've never heard someone say it out loud. Yeah, it's, uh, hold on. I should know because they uh, tried to trick us on mine when I was going through my song certification with that wine. Um, anyway, that stuff's awesome. Bo Bo uh, Bocchio. Bocchio, something like something that. Something like that. It's a bunch of EAUs. In yeah. There. Um, but I was very lucky to our Sorry, really good friend and distributor who helps us uh, get some distribution in Alaska brought down a 78 Ooh. St. Julian Bukiu and that was one of the dirtiest wines just in terms of the, just the soil elements and the nose that I've ever encountered and I'll never forget that. So yeah, you can, you can kind of see that this wine is going in that direction. It's not going to trend quite as dirty and funky, but um, it, especially when this hits 15 years old, which I think is really when you hit that top end cycle for our nap and Merlots is when you start to get that real tremendous balance between uh, fruit mineral and earth. That's just, just, just so pleasant. And again, this is the 2017, if I didn't say that before. All right, I guess it's time to taste it. Yeah. Hey, cheers, bro. Cheers, man. Thanks for being on my show. Yeah, of course. So it's got, I mean, the first thing I notice is it's got just an amazing sort of dissolving tan in yeah. all over the palate. It's still got that grit because it's young, but you know that's going to slide away in, with some age, but that dissolving tan is uh, something I love. Yeah. It's so satisfying to me, and you know it's going to be great with food uh, because of that. This, like, it, it's, with you guys, you remember those are always so well structured, like so focused on structure, that kind of like, um, that kind of, Grippy herbal thing that kicks in on the finish. I'm digging. That's the first thing that jumped out at me when it went down. Was this kind of grippy herbal thing? It's also the tannins are medium plus. It's there, like they're not playing around, but they're still mellow enough to where you can get to the fruit. It's not like Barolo, where a young Barolo you can't even get to the fruit because the tannins too nuts and the acid too nuts. You can you know what's going on here. As I was saying before, that plump skin thing kind of kicks in in the third quarter on your palate. You get a little bit of that tart. Tartness of, and bitterness of a little bit of that plum skin. You have blueberries and and, uh, and cassis up front all day. It's like again, that is kind of like the vehicle that's driving down your palate, and other things are jumping in on the ride as it goes down. Yeah, really, really cool stuff. I'm actually getting a little bit of the olive, but let me taste it a little bit more because I'm curious to know where it's hitting. I'm catching the olive, but I want to know. I want to pinpoint where I'm catching that. It's like the end of the third quarter, this, you get this kind of uh, black olive thing that is really unique to this. The minerality kick on this is killer. Yeah. Like, yeah, the texture is silky, long finish. I love your guys' Merlots. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's Spring Mountain. Other people probably make Merlots. But I've tried other Merlots, and for whatever reason, I keep on coming back here. It's like that girl, that you, you know what I mean? Like that yeah. girl back in the day that, you well, know, no matter how many girls you dated after, if you could get back in, you're going back to her. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's, it's amazing trying all the Merlots just on Spring Mountain because this, this ABA is so varied and, and different. Um, you know, even just every hundred feet that you travel upwards, and that's primarily because of, um, you know, how much rain we get over the thousands and thousands of years, the erosion that's developed over here. Um, you have these gullies and inlets and fingers of, of earth that create these undulations through the mountain range um, that almost create their own, that do create their own microclimates separate and distinct from your neighbor. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Spring Mountain is, is, is its own ADA, but even within it, you can, you can find like four or five different core regions of Spring Mountain that all have different aspects and where Merlot acts, behaves, and uh, expresses itself very differently. Um, so you have that factor mm -hmm. where you know our Merlot vineyard is very different from the one right above us, uh -huh. um, and then obviously our, our style and, and philosophy is all about that balanced traditional style. So from you know relative to the rest of the valley, harvesting fairly early, mm -hmm. um, trying to maintain acidity 
age ability and food, and food, food pairing ability is, is, is priority number one, two, and three. If um, it was like, so I can I always have my ideas, but like when you're pairing this wine with something, what is your pairing? Um, gosh, I was in, uh, we did a pairing contest when I was in Japan uh, doing some market work for Keenan. Uh, I brought job. over. I know, right? <laughs> what a life, brother. Yeah, just a little, just a little humble brag. A little humble there. brag. Uh, <laughs> just in Japan doing just marketing Japan, research. Just in Japan, deal, dude, you know? Uh, Everybody does that, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, the organizer of the event wanted all the producers. I was there with uh, Alan Viadere and uh, Bruce Cakebread and, and a, a number of other oh, folks. Wow. Yeah, some, some, some names, great names. It was a cool panel. And everyone sent their favorite recipe ahead of time so that then these Japanese chefs could then try and make it. Oh, cool. And um, I sent one that was actually really, really complicated for them to make because they didn't have, Japan didn't have the right chilies. Mm -hmm. I needed some, I needed a particular type of Mexican chili for this uh, mole sauce. Serrano or something like that? I can't remember what it was. They may not have Serrano's over there. That might, you might have nailed it. But uh, yeah, it was, it's a chili mole sauce okay. that I can, that I like to put on this, on chicken essentially. <laughs> and it's it's got a little bit of sweetness from the brown sugar in the recipe, but it's also also got a little bit of heat that brings out the earthy qualities of the Merlot um, that I that I love. Um, unfortunately, they weren't able to do it quite quite well enough. Also, Alan Vidar sent ahead this amazing like God, it must have been like this tr like lamb chimichurri, <laughs> and that was just crazy going with his uh, with his Mount Meter um, thing or how I think he's, uh, he's right below how Mount. But yeah, that, that was a killer. But yeah, it's uh, this we have this family recipe uh, for mole sauce mm -hmm. that just kills it. Um, a little bit of cinnamon in there as well. That kind of brings out the spice elements of, of the merlot. That's just killer. So you guys are so worldly. Like, <laughs> you just never think you would uh, have a mole <laughs> recipe. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, you, I don't look it, uh, but I have, my mom has got a lot of Spanish in okay. heritage on her side. Uh, we just somehow genetically shed all elements of, of swarthiness <laughs> and really leaned into being pale. But uh, yeah, I, 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 as you know, I'm obsessed with spicy food. I, yeah, I can't get enough of it. So that may or may not have anything to do with it. But yeah, that, that all comes from her side of the family um, and that, that type of influence. So yeah, that, that's good. And then, of course, the aforementioned triple cream cheeses. So oh, yeah. Can't, can't lose. Yeah, the acid will destroy that. I think. Yeah. It's like this Merlot has acid. This does not have enough apples. Yeah. This is this has got chiseled. This is this kind is, of six pack. There's a focus here. It's really yeah. nice. And of course, and I, I, I may be a little bit biased. Well, I, of course I am. Uh, <laughs> growing up with big, structured, young mountain wines a lot in my life is. I mean, this is one of the favorite wines. Just drink wines. Of course. It, it's, it doesn't. It's got the structure and the tannin and the acidity, but you know, one bottle for one man, it's not going to dry you out, brother. <laughs> you talking to it's the perfect bottles? I mean, that gets you started. That gets you started. <laughs> and then you go from there. But I know that there's obviously a lot of wines, that, especially when they're less than ten years old. You know, taking down a whole bottle of Mountain Fruit is a little exhausting on the palate. Where I, I don't think the Merlot um, necessarily does that, which is nice. Yeah. So I've known Riley for a long time. <laughs> I've been around him for a while. I love the guy, and that's why I threw him on the on this show. I, I just I enjoy being around him. You can tell we we get along very well. So you're third generation here. I, uh, I, that's what I choose to believe. <laughs> what do you do here? Um, so everyone wears multiple hats here. Uh, we're a pretty small operation. Uh, so plus my, my dad and I, plus uh, five other full time employees. Um, so. Um, Really what I do is I, I, I sort of do a miniature version of my dad's full-time job, which is sales and marketing. Um, we have such a talented team here on, on property, especially on the winemaking side, that has been doing what they've been doing for so long. Which is to say the institutional knowledge that we've built up over the last, let's see, our, our, our current seller master has been here since 2003. His assistant Dave has been with us for about at least three years. And Matt, uh, who, who is kind of the, the ops manager of, of the winemaking, has been here since 94. Oof. So the, really the three of those, those guys form this sort of triumvirate of our institutional knowledge of what happens in the cellar, what happens in the vineyard. And because of their skill level and how good and reliable they are at their job, my dad was lucky enough to make the decision early in his career when he got up here in 97 that he did not need to spend time in the cellar. It wasn't necessary for him to be here all the time. During harvest, during blending, during the important sort of bottleneck moments throughout the process, it's important for him to be here and some decisions need to be made. But he realized early on that his efforts and energies were best suited, focused on selling the stuff. Gotcha. Okay. Which, as it turns out, is the hardest part of this job. Of course. <laughs> because, uh, you know, once you've got the recipe down, once you've got the good vineyards going, 
uh, you got to convince someone to take it from you and they give you some money in exchange. And so that's been, um, that's, he, he, he knew that that would be the best way he could be helpful early on. And that's sort of the path that I've followed almost immediately. Um, it was important for me to get experience in the seller, um, just because it, it did, it felt hollow representing these wines and not having a hand in, in doing at least a couple vintages. And so that's, that's been my process. But, but as we know, really my first job uh, <laughs> coming out of college in the wine business that really didn't feel like it was just seller rap duties was uh, working as a server and a song at Eno, an awesome, formerly awesome wine bar, who knows what the future holds now, yeah. in Union Square in San Francisco. That's where I met Jay. And, and, uh, I miss you, Eno. <laughs> and all, all that gang. And really, I mean, that, that was the form, that was, you know, obviously drinking wines at the family table when I was a kid was, was the original formula. Um, hustling all night, working with, if not dozens, hundreds of other producers from around the world on this ever-changing menu um, was really where I think I cut my teeth and actually gained not only um, sharper skill set for presenting and understanding wines, um, but a much higher interest level in being a part of this world. Um, so yeah, I was there for maybe I think a year and a half, and that's all it took to just be like, okay, I It was I pretty fast paced there. Like, we was, we was, he hit the ground running. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, like, yeah, no choice. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and it was the, the friendly, you know, roasting. I, I'll, I'll never forget the first couple weeks, like, you know, you put in you put in a nine or ten hour shift and you're still there at 145 counting tips and clearing tables. And I'll never forget, it probably was Jay that made fun of me, but he, he probably looked over all the work that he was still doing cleaning up. He's like, you, your family has a winery. Why, why are you here right now at 145 in the morning cleaning? Yeah, man. And it was because, you know, and, and truth is at that time is because I didn't, I didn't understand the business. There, there wasn't room for me to have a role up here at the time. And it just, it, it was very much a business I wasn't a part of. And I also grew up in Oakland. So there was that, there was that yep. physical distance between it. So, uh, you know, and working with you and, and, uh, and Steven and, and everybody else really helped close that gap, yeah. both, both intellectually and physically. So, um, yeah, you know, you know, did it for yeah. sure. Open that door to the world that was already there for me, but just in a totally new way. What do you do on the sell side? Uh, so I've been given a whole bunch of many, many states. Uh, <laughs> so and I've been doing that for for my dad directly for the last four years. So I, I, I did a small stint in Georgia. I worked for our distributor there on the ground. I ran a small territory just west of, uh, of Atlanta and, and kind of you know, grounded out for about a year in really what is probably the hardest job in this business, which is being a sales rep on the ground, in your car every single day, with a sample bag, with a, you know, district manager breathing down your neck, and a bunch of customers that are ungrateful. Uh, that was a very important job to have, because, yeah. boy, the one true lesson I, I brought back from that was, A, I'm bad at that job. So it's good that I'm I was too, though. I don't have to I was too, you weren't, the, you weren't the only one. And, yeah, it takes a certain backbone to really be good at that. Yeah. Uh, and, and then two, if you can find a good sales rep who's reliable and follows through with what they promise they're going to do, hold on to them with both hands. Yeah. Because they're so rare. And if you can start, if you can build a good relationship with them, then you can both really start making good money and, and live a lot more comfortably and not have to always just go out to the to every other corner liquor store and try and sell a bottle at a time. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I was working at Eno, working briefly as a sales rep. I then I was able to come pivot back here with a much better understanding of what my role can be and how to best execute it. Okay, so specifically, <laughs> uh, because of your uh, what you're doing right now, where you're flying around, where where you work was, where, yeah. where you're flying around, um, and now you're in sales for Keenan. <laughs> I want to ask you this: um, the, is the wine lifestyle as you're as as you're in it? Is it conducive to uh, being a young single man? Uh, in the COVID dating scene, yeah. what I mean is like you know how uh, if you're dating right now. Yeah. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> how, well, uh, openly. <laughs> how how is this? Is it conducive to? Uh, is the wine lifestyle conducive to that dating scene? Well, no. The last year sucked. Okay. But I say that confidently, knowing that it's probably sucked for a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's been. Uh, but yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, I like it. Um, I think you know. I, Got to come up with, come, got to come up with a fourth generation somehow, mm -hmm. and you know it's, you know, being with someone for uh, an extended period of time enough to develop a nice little relationship that you might see as something you want to be interested in going forward is tough because, you know, in a different city every other couple of days um, for weeks on end, which is which is tough. So it's a lot of fun. I still think I'm still in the golden age of enjoying that. Yeah. Um, 
so I, I wouldn't want to change anything, but um, you know, you know gotta, gotta sell it out at some point. <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> uh, we just just built a house up here, so it's it's tough. Yeah, well, so it's nice property. It's really really nice, um, and it'd be, it'd be cool to have a family in there down the road. Yeah. But uh, yeah, for now I enjoy um, going to Japan and making chicken mole. <laughs> Just being on the road. Trying, trying to stay out of trouble. I, know, yeah, I, just, you know, I love traveling. And I hate flying, but I love traveling. Yeah, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I think a lot of people feel that way. But uh, you know, it's if not now, then then when? Yeah. It's, this job's only going to get harder the older I get. Just flying, flying, flying. I'm glad my dad's not here because that guy grinds harder than anyone I know. Yeah. He's 62 and he's still doing it full time. Pops so. will tell you, like he'll, I, or, yeah, he's, Pops, I'll tell you, but he'll show you like where you're falling short. My father oh. was the same way. He just Always working, always was working, and even in retirement, we thought he was gonna retire and be done. He got another job, and now he got, he's in education now. Went from like working at AT and T for all these years and retired, and now he's in education, and he's been doing that for like the last I don't know eight nine years. And I, no, they're definitely cut from the same cloth. Yeah, he just keeps on working. The yeah. I understand. I, I mean, I, I I get a little honestly too, you know, like I I have to be doing something. Yeah. So I mean, I honestly think that's that's a key part of how he balances his life. Yeah. It's like, well, I've gotten four days of good family time, and now i got to spend a week in Florida, and I'll come back nice and refreshed, and yeah. not <laughs> arguing. And, um, you know, that's, uh, I, I, lo I love this job, for sure. And, and I, I obviously, the advantages, I, I have that extra bit of energy going out selling these products because uh, of how emotionally invested I am with this stuff, which only backfires. Yeah, uh, I get very sensitive when I talk about these wines, and um, I feel bad sometimes for some people that I'm, Conversing with about wine because they, you know they're casual talking about yeah. wine and having an opinion about something and meanwhile I'm thinking like God what an idiot <laughs> why would you say something like that or, or they, you know they say something it's hard this is in your blood though like, it's hard to like tear yourself away from like the the le the legacy here man like yeah. and it's a hell of a legacy so I get it you know um, I, I I I always remember that uh, Dave Chappelle bit where his son was so excited to go to a Kevin Hart comedy show and he, he made he made Dave bring him and he was all excited he couldn't be yeah this is the best this is a UC crowd this is the best show I've ever seen and Dave Chappelle's like ugh you know I do this too right like, I always think that even with some of my friends who are all excited about you know they got this new bottle of Diamond Creek yeah. you know, auctions uh -huh. and talking to me about all this Diamond Dunn this Dunn that they're collecting it's like ugh we do this stuff too, yeah, you know? yeah, I mean, We got that kind of stash, what are you talking about? And I, and I love those wines, but uh, that's how sensitive I am. It's like, you could be buying key to me. You can holler at me, I got, yeah, I got, I got, I got a, a discount for you. <laughs> so, uh, they, you guys are known for like your Bordeaux varietals here, you're known for your Chardonnay. Your Chardonnay is like, outstanding. You've got a bottle of it right here. Yeah, you see we polish this off of it. Quick work, light work. <laughs> light work. <laughs> um, and I, I remember you guys used to have Syrah here. Are there like any obscure grapes that you normally maybe have not even made it to your um, your, your lineup, but like some grapes that you guys have planted like secretly on the vineyard? That Great question, Jay. Talk, talk to me the about answer is yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, three years ago, I was fortunate enough to get the green light from my dad to uh, dive into two grapes we've never grown up here. Um, one I know, two uh, we, we're pretty sure both have never been grown on Spring Mountain. Uh, we think we're maybe one of the only people that's experimenting with in California. The list has got to be pretty short. Yeah. Just based on the availability of, of, of clones in, in nurseries, it's hard to come by. So we, we got rid of an acre and a half of, of Merlot um, that always kind of had just gotten funneled into the house blend. Um, we figured that if we were going to lose any part of the established vineyards, this seemed like it was kind of not necessarily the weak link, but it didn't have any distinguishing characteristics that kind of or made the argument that it should survive. Gotcha. And, and up here, we're planted out. Um, we have 47 acres under vine. There is nary a, a, an inch that we can expand to, um, at least legally. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so, yeah, something had to go in order to, uh, in order to grow something new. So that was an acre and a half from Merlot, right next to the Chardonnay vineyards, actually. And we divided that acre and a half into thirds. Uh, one third was gonna, it is uh, planted to Petit Verdot. So not obviously yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not, a, not a blockbuster change in, in terms of uh, weird grapes. A lot of people grow Petit Verdot, uh, but it's not something we've ever grown before. Um, we have it in barrel for the first time. We harvested it for 2020. We're very pleased with the results. I My dad got potentially overly excited during the blending because <laughs> I think he started to declare that this was going to be a single bottling now. Oh, wow. Which is another pain in the ass to worry about. <laughs> uh, I think hopefully the plan will be uh, 
uh, to experiment with it in uh, probably the reserve cap below. Gotcha. I assume is, is a really good home for that uh, because it's only a couple barrels. Uh, and then the last two grapes that were growing were the ones that, I'm, that I kind of pushed for and <laughs> somehow got permission to do. Uh, we got a third of an acre of Mouvet up here. So that, as the aforementioned uh, sort of uh, Tempier um, sort of tribute, which is a, a label that I fell in love with as a very young man and have always been uh, drawn to. I'm lucky enough to grow up in the East Bay, close by to Kermit Lynch, yeah. who has been a huge proponent of Tempier uh, for, for a long, long time. So that, that kind of was the inspiration there. Um, and so this year we harvested that also for the first time. And I kind of made the decision, you know, let's, because of everything that was happening this year, in fact, that it was leaf three, let's hedge a little bit and just go with something. Let's, let's just do a little bit more. Let's do a rosé. Let's not try and pull out all the stops and do the red table wine, which eventually we'll, we will want to do. So this year we have made our, the, our first rosé ever. Keenan has never done a rosé. So we have a single block, single vineyard, Mouvet rosé. So that'll be out uh, by summer, okay. if I can get the label done. Another thing I'm glad my dad's not here to complain about. I, <laughs> dad, I've taken it forever. I do. Yeah. I do. Uh, and then the last thing, which is the, the really kind of out of left field experiment, is going to be our little third of an acre of Menthea, which is a grape that I think Americans are quickly becoming accustomed to. Yes. Uh, Raul Perez, Perez the is world. the guy. He's, oh he's definitely the maven that really pushed this stuff hard in, in, in the States. Mm -hmm. And he's gotten a lot of press for it. He's been on Wine Experience Top 100 number of times. Uh, he also makes so bad, good. makes bad ass Cadeo too, which yeah. is so good. I've done a review on the uh, on the Mentia, um, back in the day, and I, I just yeah, that raw raw Perez. Like, yeah, and I haven't even had the opportunity to taste those wines when they get older. I've only had the young stuff. Oh really? Is, so I'm really I, I can't wait to see the ageability. The oldest vintage I have of, of some Rebels, like a 2010. Yeah, that's about the oldest. Still haven't opened it yet. Um, it's about the oldest I've had. Yeah, so I, and that's really exciting. It's still very much of a question mark of how of what's going to happen. Obviously, the, the plan is to do a, a, an ageable, balanced, traditional style table wine, just like everything else we do, and uh, and go from there. And uh, and, it, and that'll be that'll be obviously for wine club and stay here in the taste room because it's only a third of an acre. But um, you know, it's just part of it's part of progression and trying things that are new in Napa. And you know, if there are top three complaints that people have about Napa. Um, I think one of them is definitely the the sort of oversaturation of a particular of, of, of a particular focus on a, on a few varieties. Gotcha. Obviously, Cabernet, Chardonnay, um, Sauvignon Blanc, Merlot. I mean, Napa does what it does very well, but it, it but it doesn't do a ton of other things. It reminds you know, me. Of, it reminds me of that. Uh, maybe the, I don't know if you were, were around when the Peridot was there. The Tempranillo that was. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and Napa, and a lot of people were just like. Tempranillo. Napa. Yeah, and it was so good. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah, and you really and there's of course tons and tons of these small little uh, projects that you just you never know of until someone puts the bottle in front of you. But I'm pretty sure there isn't any Menthea going on in the valley as for now. Uh, but uh, that's just based on on anecdotal uh, conversations and stuff. So uh, next year will be the first year for the Menthea because we. It's leaf three for most of the vines, but it's only leaf two for some of them because we still we couldn't even get enough clones to cover a third of an acre. That's how hard it was to get our hands on them. So um, next year will be our first shot at maybe doing something substantial. I cannot stuff. wait. Yeah, that'll be fun. That'll <laughs> I can't be fun. Wait. Well, I'm nervous, I'm very nervous, but uh, um, you know, there's so many things that Menthea can blend with if it doesn't work on its own here. And you can make it into a rosé too. Totally, yeah, a bad, pretty good rosé. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, so. Really excited about that, and, and, uh, and almost impatient. I really I want, to see, I want to see what those grapes are going to look like. Plus, awesome. you got to show it to your pops. You're like, "Yo, totally. this is what I did." <laughs> totally, totally. And, and there needs to be some justification for his leeway here. So uh, we'll see. So, with that being said, we're talking about your father, your third generation again. What do you see for the future of Keenan? Because it's going to be, it may be in your hands, bro. Maybe, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not saying that your father's going to retire anytime soon. Your father seems the type that's going to be Well, there's always the chance that the sister, the, the uh, prodigal sister, could comes back. Return, could return, <laughs> just abandon, abandon her, her medical degree and come back. How does your mom feel about that? Uh, my mom? Oh, my mom just wants whatever, however, whatever makes us happy. That's, uh, that's been the outlook for, my, uh, for both my parents. I love your mom. Uh, they're very, they've been very great about that. It's, you know, just find something that makes you happy. Um, how I would feel about that might be something different. <laughs> uh, it, it would be a change now I see the future 
you going, but uh, you know, Maddie can do whatever she wants. She's very smart and very capable, uh, and, and her skill set definitely would lend itself to uh, the production side. That's always been really close. Yeah, I can't wait to see her. She's back today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, to, get, to get back to your to your question, um, I, I think the focus, like like I ever want her in here now, but the, the way that you survive, uh, the way that you hedge against volatility of, of relying on restaurants and retail yeah. is you build that direct list. Yeah. So like everybody else, uh, grow the wine club, get more people in the tasting room, get more people here. Um, because as you know, and anyone who's visited Keenan, is the moment you set foot you know, on Spring Mountain, the, the environment is really making the sale for us. Yeah. Just so pretty up here, it's so unique. Uh, you get away from the crowds on the valley floor, there's no traffic. Uh, the wine is very different. Uh, it's hot. Uh, yeah, that's that's that, that would be the overall goal is to expand our hospitality program, expand the experience, and enrich the experience that people get when they when they come to our front doors. Because um, which isn't to say what we offer isn't great now, but you know we, our our platform is so great. Um, there's always more that we can do, and I think as as restaurants, you know, we'll see who recovers and, and what how what the health of the restaurant industry is in the next couple of years, but. Um, it's 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 because it's gotten to the point where it's it's not a, it's not always going to be a reliable place for sales because uh, if you're not running into domination by the giant corporate wineries, mm -hmm. uh, you're running into restaurants that uh, just don't work with the price point of Napa, and so you're caught in between, uh, which is tough. And then retail can be even worse. Yeah. Uh, independent retail is atrophying every single year. It's shrinking Agreed. every single year. Um, again, getting dominated by Bevmo and Total and and whatnot, and, and who knows when Amazon will step into this game? Yeah, because um, you know they're going to. Yeah, I know. And they get into everything. And, well, that's I, I love bringing up the point that Amazon has taken a look at all of the laws that they would have to deal with across the country to effectively serve people alcohol, and they said, "Fuck that. <laughs> let's let's wait till that gets easier to navigate because that's something that we deal with with a staff of two in the office yeah. every single day." Um, so yeah, retail is shrinking. It's a, it's a it's a pool that's getting smaller and, and much more dominated by the people that can pay to play. And that's not our game at all. It's not you know just just from a philosophical standpoint, that's something we'll never do. So to rely on individuals and those personal connections that we make is, is the way forward for us. Man, that's and, why I love this place. Yeah, <laughs> and and yeah, and, and that this is exactly what we do. Is, is we we I maintain relationships and keep friendships and. Yes. And uh, and that's that's how, how I see it working out. Yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate you inviting me up here a few times, and just to kind of talk and just to catch up. Without any of this, this was not even the, the game plan. We were just catching up because we hadn't seen each other in a while. And he was talking, and I was like, "Yo, you know what? Like, what? we don't we never talk about your position in this family-owned winery. Let's let's get into it." And so I really appreciate you letting me come back up here and just hang out. Drink some wine, drink some of this beautiful wine that I love so much. Yeah, no, it's it's, uh, <laughs> it's really I, I I obviously I'll have the privilege of leading this this pack at some point, mm -hmm. um, but it's my main job is going to be to keep make sure that there's a situation here where everyone's happy, they want to be here, um, because if you if you can check that box, the the wine almost will sell itself. Yeah, it's real tough. It's, it's still tough to sell, but when Laura's happy, Elizabeth's happy, Matt's happy, Art's happy, Dave's happy. Um, it doesn't really matter what's going on with me. If those guys are happy, then this business is you're alive, good. alive yeah. and well. It's um, really so that's that's the goal. Keep everyone happy here. By extension, the customers will be happy, and, and uh, we'll have our doors open for the for forever. Hopefully, <laughs> as long as the climate allows us to continue farming up here. I love it, guys. Buy Keenan. If you can't buy the more expensive stuff, which is really not not expensive, to be honest with you, um, buy the Merlot because this is. In my opinion, the best Merlot in Napa. Yeah. And I'm going to wine say club, it. get 20% off everything. I'm going to continue to say it, man. I'm going to scream it from the mountaintops. Best Merlot in Napa. So, anyway, thanks for being on my show, man. Thank cheers, you, sir. my brother. It was a pleasure. I appreciate you. Until next time, guys, cheers. Cheers, everybody.